Jeff Gerwich here for Modern Tactical Shooting. Now, about a month ago, I asked you, the viewer, via Facebook and Instagram to send in your questions for me to answer. I like to do this every few months. And the majority of the questions I got have to do asking me about my time in Special Forces or certain things about Special Forces. So because the majority of the questions were about Special Forces, this video is going to be dedicated to nothing but answering your questions you have of me about my time in special forces so let's go all right so the first question i've received is what do 18 bravos train on in terms of guns now the 18 bravo is the weapons sergeant of the oda the weapons specialist and supposed to be a subject matter expert on small unit tactics i went through the course in 1998 so i'm a little dated uh, i didn't get to train on the javelin until later on but as a 18 Bravo, you're going to train on everything from pistols all the way up to your rockets and missiles. So pistols from around the world, submachine guns, assault rifles, and then you're getting into your medium and your heavy machine guns all the way up to the DSHK or the Dishka as it's referred to, Soviet version of our 50 cal basically, a little bit bigger bullet. And then your mortars, 60 millimeter mortar, up to your 120 millimeter mortar, and your rockets. Now at the time, the largest rocket we trained on was the tow missile and some recoilless rifles. And now, of course, they train on the Javelin, uh, the Carl Gustav. And we also trained on the Stinger missile. And when I say train on these weapon systems, you have to be able to disassemble, assemble, uh, functions, checks, all these different weapon systems, and be able to fire them. So you got to be able to operate these weapon systems. Now, if weapon systems come out after you go through the Q course, at Fort Bragg, there's a weapons facility where they basically have a catalog of all the weapons from all around the world. So as an 18 Bravo, you can request these weapon systems to train on or go, or go back to the weapons committee at Fort Bragg and get your hands on these guns to train. So say if you're going to a certain part of the world where a certain weapon system is prevalent in that area, and it's not available at your SF group because each SF group keeps a small amount of foreign weapons to train on. If it's not available at the group, you can go to Fort Bragg and get your hands on that weapon so you know how to operate that weapon system if it's prevalent in the country you're going to. So 18 Bravo, I thought it was the best time uh, on the ODA. I thought being a weapon sergeant was great because I got to control all the guns and ammo. But yes, uh, everything from your pistols all the way up to your rockets and missiles. Now, the next question is, can Special Forces soldiers use their own firearms? And the official answer is no. Now, on a Special Forces team, there is a lot of firepower uh, available to that ODA. If you compare it to a 110-man infantry company, we have more firepower on that 12-man team than most infantry companies. My last tour in 2015, aside from our small arms, such as our pistols, our M4s, our SCAR heavies, we also had multiple M240 machine guns. We had two Mark 47 uh, grenade launchers. We had two Mark 19s. We had two mini guns. I believe we had four 50 cals. We had two Carl Gustafs. We had all the AT4s and law rockets we could ever want. Uh, we had javelins available if we wanted to carry the javelin. Uh, so we had a lot of munitions that a 12-man team uh, can use. If we had to break down all the different weapon systems and each man had to carry a certain amount, I think there's seven or eight different weapon systems available to each Special Forces soldier on an ODA. So there's a lot of firepower, uh, firepower within that 12-man team. All right, next question, what is my favorite piece of issued gear? And I don't have a favorite piece of issued gear, but I have a favorite issued uniform, and that is our Patagonias. Now, everybody associates CRY uniforms with special operations, but CRY went to tier one units. We got issued Patagonia uniforms, uh, basically just as good in my mind. Uh, the only problem is we only got issued two sets. Now, here's my Patagonia pants. I didn't really care for the top, but the pants are pretty cool. Uh, you don't blouse them into your boots and in Special Forces. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I went Special Forces, aside from being able to put your hands in pockets. I despise blousing boots. You don't blouse these. Uh, they have slots for built-in knee pads. But basically, I like the material, very lightweight, and they have a lot of built-in pockets, so I found these pants very comfortable. They do have a tendency to rip in the crotch, but my two pairs held strong. That's one issue with Special Forces. They're kind of cheap, and you only get issued two sets of Patagonias. 
It's a seven day work week and you could be living out of this uniform for multiple days and you only get issue two. The rest are your issued OCP or whatever they're calling the multicams now. So I really like these pants and they still make great range pants today if I wanna have the tactical cool look. So yes, Patagonia's were my favorite piece of issued gear. Now along the lines of clothing, what was my favorite footwear? Well, I was a big Merrill guy. Uh, this is a photo, this is underneath my, uh, my bunk back in Afghanistan multiple different pairs of Merrells, but I will say this, I was a huge Merrell guy up until my last tour in 2015, and I would not recommend Merrell shoes to anyone today. I would say in the last five years, their standards have really dropped, and before I would wear a pair of Merrell shoes, and I could wear them until I wore a, a hole in the sole of the shoe. Now, uh, it seems after six months, something is going to be going to come unglued on Merrells, the sole or seams or something. They're just not made to the same quality standards that they were made years ago. A very popular shoe, and I saw this rising in 2015, is Solomon. I would say that's probably the number one brand SF guys are wearing now when it comes to their own footwear. Now, back in Garrison, we got to wear the old outdated army boots, and I think Army boots are completely horrible. They're an archaic design. Uh, Merrell hiking shoes is what I wore, but many guys are like Solomon's and of course all the other brands. And people ask, hey, aren't you worried about twisting an ankle wearing low tops? During my entire time in Special Forces, and I'm sure it's, it has happened, I've never come across a guy twisting his ankle on a mission. I've seen more guys get injured doing box jumps in the gym on uh, crappy made wooden boxes than I have ankle injuries from low top hiking shoes. And if you want high performance, you need high performance footwear. There are proven studies that the heavier the shoe you wear, the less performance you have due to that weight, and army boots fall into that category. They're too heavy. So if you want high performing special forces soldiers, uh, you, we need to be wearing the high performance footwear. I was a huge Merrell fan, but really not any more uh, due their, to their lack of quality. Now, staying on that gear theme, another question I got was, what was my favorite piece of unconventional kit? And to best answer this, really, everything I used uh, by the end of my time as special forces, I was using all my own gear. My own helmet, my own plate carrier, this ATS Aegis plate carrier. I have a separate video on this. I wore this for two tours in Afghanistan. Uh, during my time back in Iraq, I was wearing the issued plate carriers of the time, but I rocked a lot of my own pouches. And as a professional soldier, I thought it was worth the money to invest in my own gear. After all, I was living out of it. I was uh, relying on it to save my life. So why not invest in my own gear that I thought suited me the best? Uh, if you hire a carpenter, chances are they're using their own tools that they trust and they know. And I view that the same way with gear. Again, if you're a professional soldier and you're going to live and uh, rely on this gear, why not invest in your own money? Now, if you're into buying gear, I don't recommend going out and buying everything all at once. I collected and I got all the gear I ended up using by the time I retired in Special Forces over a period of a few years as I found certain things that worked for me and they may have not been the most expensive stuff or the most trendy items out there, but I found they worked for me. Uh, like I wore that uh, gunfighter Mitch helmet all the way up until my last tour in Afghanistan and most Special Forces soldiers had long moved on to the Ops Corps helmet. I just never found one that fit me right. So unconventional kit, really everything was my own gear, uh, my plate carriers, my packs, uh, everything, my gun belt, everything was all my own. So that is my unconventional gear, was investing in all my own gear. All right, the next question is one that I have gotten a lot, and that is, will I be doing a history of the Mark 12 with Special Forces video? And probably not. Now, the Mark 12 is the SPR, or Special Purpose Rifle. Came out in 2000, just in time for the War on Terror. And the reason why I will probably not do one is I have very limited uh, first-hand pictures of myself using one. In my history of Special Forces videos, I only like using uh, pictures and videos that I have that I've taken myself 
or pictures submitted by people I've served with. I don't like scrolling the internet and just downloading photos and videos to use while I narrate. There are plenty of other better YouTube channels where they talk about the history of guns. I like to talk about it from my user perspective. And honestly, I only have one photo of uh, me using a Mark 12, and that was in 2004 Iraq. It's this photo right here. Now, I always like to uh, mention the gentleman next to me. And at the time, this is Specialist Keith Fiscus. He was attached to us from the 25th Infantry Division. We had a squad attached to us. It's called an uplift. And I always like to mention him because a year later, he was killed in action in Iraq. So he made the ultimate sacrifice. So if I'm gonna post a picture of myself with a Mark 12, I'm gonna talk about Keith Fiscus. Uh, later, he was Sergeant Fiscus. He was an awesome trooper, uh, excellent soldier, and uh, I still think about him to this day. So I just like to mention him whenever I show this photo right here. But back to the Mark 12, uh, it came out in 2000. I actually tested the first five prototypes that Steve Holland brought to Fifth Group. Now, Steve Holland, he's a legend in Special Forces, at least in Fifth Special Forces Group, he got us the 1911. He worked on the Mark 47 grenade launcher program, and he played a big part in the Mark 12. Now that Mark 12 rifle uh, in fifth group, we have the Holland edition named after Steve Holland. And that was a few guys in the SIF, the Commander's Interdiction Force. They had some modified Mark 12s. There's a famous photo here. It's called the Piss Bottle full, uh, photo, uh, photo. And this is Travis Rolf. He was a member of the SIF. And of course, now he runs uh, Velocity Systems, uh, producing some awesome tactical gear, but he carries this modified Mark 12 back in the early days in Iraq. Now, the Mark 12 was in use with Special Forces to about 2010. And I say this because I did time in 5th Special Forces Group, and then I did time as an instructor at Fort Bragg, and then I switched to 3rd Special Forces Group in 2010. And when I showed up on a Special Forces team in 3rd Group, they had one Mark 12 sitting in the rack, and most of the guys, to include the 18 Bravos at the time, had never even shot it. It was, it was just considered a relic. And then that year in 2010, all the Mark 12s got turned in and they're no longer use, in use with Special Forces. Now concerning the Mark 12, uh, the gun was ahead of its time and really was an answer to the problem of Soft Mod Block 1. Soft Mod Block 1 had some limitations. Nobody used the Knight's Armament Suppressor. It was deemed too heavy and not effective enough. Uh, generally, most SF guys didn't run it. And of course, we had the carbine linked handguards. With the Mark 12, aside from getting an accurized barrel, we got a full length handguard and we got a very practical and feasible suppressor. Uh, that gun shot beautifully. And a lot of the guys, they didn't really use it in the role uh, that was designed to be a DMR style rifle. A lot of the guys, uh, they would just take the Mark 12 upper and made it with their M4 lower and basically use it as an assault rifle. Granted, it had a much more accurate barrel with Mark 77 or Mark 262 77 grain ammo. That gun shot under one MOA. It was a beautiful rifle to shoot, accurate out to about six to 700 yards. It was limited in the fact that it came with a uh, M3 Alpha 10 power scope at the time. Uh, LPVOs weren't a thing when the Mark 12 first came out, but uh, it was an answer to that limited uh, ability of the soft mod block one program, those optics, lights, and lasers. Now with soft mod block two, really I can see why the Mark 12 fell out of favor. It was a heavier gun and that A2 butt stock, which is perfect for prone shooting. Really it's too long for if you're wearing body armor, uh, I can see why it fell out of favor because uh, with the soft mod block two program, and this is a clone of my rifle that I used in 2015 with all soft mod block two, my own LPVO that I ran, this is a VCOG one to six. Really this has all the same capabilities of that Mark 12. Now granted your stock SOCOM barrel is not as accurate, but uh, again, we're, we're laying down the lead with these rifles. Yes, we're trying to get accurate fire out to 500 yards or 500 meters. But this, this does the job well. So the Mark 12 was just kind of overkill and not needed anymore. You have the full length rail with the RIS-2 and you have LPVOs becoming uh, more and more being used. And of course we had the LCAN that came out in 2007. So the Mark 12, again, a great tool during soft mod block one, but with the rollout of soft mod block two, 
outside of the very accurate barrel that that Mark 12 came with, it really offered nothing else. I kind of wish there was a modern Mark 12. I wish it was revamped and reissued. Um, there are some great options out there in terms of uh, AR accessories. But unfortunately, again, the program was canceled in 2010. I only have this one photo and I have some photos that Travis Rolfe has allowed me to use here on my YouTube channel. And that's why I haven't done a history of the Mark 12 video with Special Forces. Again, I only have limited experience with it. I only used it for one tour and very limited photos. Now I got a quick question about the M110 or the SR25. I showed up with my first Special Forces team, ODA 531 in 5th Special Forces Group in 1998. They had just gotten in the SR25, which is that 762 gas gun. Uh, and it was very finicky in the desert and I wasn't a huge fan. Now later on it became the M110, a more reliable system. Personally, I never used one and most of the teams I was on, we didn't really use the M110 a whole lot. Uh, we used the SCAR Heavy uh, more of it, more because we wanted a battle rifle. Now, the M110 did get used a lot in Special Forces. There are teams that rock them in Afghanistan. It's a great 800 meter gun, uh, so it shines out in Afghanistan. But when you compare it to the SCAR Heavy, the SCAR Heavy is lighter and it's shorter. So it's just more feasible 762 rifle to be carrying. And 762, really, it's a great 800 meter cartridge. Yes, you can hit out to 1,000 with your different uh, 762 sniper rifles, but really you're stretching its capability when you're out to 1,000. It really shines at around six to 800 yards or meters in my mind. So I never really used one. Most of the teams I was on, yeah, we would train on them, but when it came to going out and about uh, on missions, uh, a lot of guys would rock the scar heavy. All right, this next question is a good one. What did I do during my time at the Special Warfare Training Center, or SWIC as we call it? Now, in Special Forces, if you serve long enough, uh, you are going to go back to Fort Bragg and you're going to be an instructor at one of the phases in the Q course or an instructor at one of our courses within Special Forces. I really lucked out. I served in 5th Special Forces Group for eight years. I was hiding out and eventually they got me and they gave me the SWIC assignment and I was assigned to Sephardic. And it's a huge acronym, I'm not gonna explain it on here, but basically it was our hostage rescue school, our primary close quarter battle school, and I was the primary flat range instructor. Uh, I was X-Ray 03 and I did that job for about two years. Uh, and then when I got promoted to E8 Master Sergeant, uh, once you make E8, they put you in charge of a committee. And I was moved to the Foreign Officer Training Program. Now I had a blast in Sephardic. It was a dream come true. Unlimited ammo to train on. It's an eight week course. So you're out there training fellow Green Berets for eight weeks. It's considered an advanced course. You're not gonna go through Sephardic in the Q course. You're gonna go to Sephardic if you're a member of the SIF or if you're lucky and you get a slot on a normal ODA like I did, and then later on I went back and because I'd been through the course, I was able to become an instructor and I was the primary flat range instructor. Uh, I taught combat marksmanship was my primary job. But once I made E8, I was assigned to the foreign officer training program. Now in the United States, in the United States Special Forces, we allow foreign soldiers uh, from friendly countries, obviously, to come through a majority of our Special Forces qualification course. I was the NCOIC of that. It was myself, a major, and one other E7. We were a three-man committee, and about 40 Special Forces soldiers from other countries are allowed into the course at any one time. Now, there's the show that came out on the Discovery Channel back in 2009. It's called Two Weeks in Hell. You can still watch it on YouTube, and it's about the Special Forces Assessment and Selection course. And now, in that video, you'll notice every once in a while, uh, the, some soldiers are blurred out. Those blurred out soldiers are foreigners. Of course, they're not allowed to be filmed in training. I was actually out there during the filming of that. And if you watch that show, and I think it's broken down into different episodes. Now, don't blink, but if you watch that show, I appear in it for about 1.6 seconds. So if you blink, you're going to miss me. I'm walking by in one of the scenes because I was out there to monitor the foreign soldiers that were going through the course as cadre. So that's my claim to fame. I'm in two weeks in hell for about 1.6 seconds. I walk by in the background in one of the shots. But I was there during the entire filming of that. Uh, 
you know, monitoring the foreign soldiers. It was actually a super awesome program working with these uh, special forces soldiers from all around the world. And the whole idea of the program is they, of course, come here and get special forces qualified under our standards. They go back to their country and they work within their special forces units. They know our capabilities. We know their capabilities. And it pays off. My last tour in 2015 in Afghanistan, a, Roma a Romanian soldier that had been to the United States Special Forces course and I was his cadre, well, he was the team sergeant of the Romanian ODA that was co-located with us. So the, the program works and it builds great partnership. And there's some stout Special Forces soldiers uh, out there from other countries that are super tough. I won't go through the long list of all the different nations that are allowed to go, come through our course, but it was actually a pretty, uh, pretty good time that I had. All right, what is my preferred vehicle during my time in Special Forces? Well, I started out the War on Terror with uh, our Humvees, and we took the doors off, we took windows off, and we'd stick guns out every opening, and that's how we rolled early on in the war. And of course, we had Toyota trucks going into the invasion of Iraq in 2003. But as the IED threat grew in both theaters, uh, Humvees became death traps. That flat bottom uh, IEDs, super dangerous to a flat bottom Humvee, even if it's armored. And of course, that led to all these different armored vehicles. My favorite being the MATV. Had a good balance, I think, between mobility and protection for as best as, as the job as it could do in Afghanistan. So I liked the MATV here. I got plenty of photos of MATVs. Now we use side-by-sides and Polaris's and things like that, but really very limited. Uh, SF has taken a lot of casualties in Afghanistan from IEDs, from Green Berets being out on side-by-sides and four-seaters. So yeah, they look cool and they're fun to zip around on, but Every future threat that we're going to face, uh, they've watched how we've uh, been hammered by IEDs during our 20 years in the war on terror. So you need to have an IED proof uh, vehicle if you're going to be able to operate successfully and safely. Uh, the newer vehicles that are coming out now, like that Polaris Dagger A1 that the Army has adopted, and they started to adopt that as I was retiring. Yeah, it looks super cool, and you can zip around in that zero IED protection. And now that drones are being employed very successfully against the Russians in Ukraine with dropping munitions on them, uh, there's no top cover in that vehicle. So the future threat is going to be uh, drones dropping bombs. So our vehicles need to be rigged up to handle these threats because we will forever be facing IEDs in any future conflict and drones is the next emerging threat, it's here. So if you don't have top cover on your vehicle, you're also going to be unnecessarily exposing soldiers to threats. So I'm not hip on the newer vehicles the Army's adopting. Uh, they're adopting them in basically peacetime. It's kind of like soldiers are going back to wearing your standard LCE uh, style patrolling rig and not body armor. Well, great. That's great for peacetime, and it's cool for patrolling around in the woods. But in combat, you're going to wear, be wearing body armor. So I think you ought to be training in body armor still. Your LCEs, again, are cool, and they're great for patrolling and living out of. But let's be realistic. In a firefight, you're going to want body armor. And if you're in the Army, you're really not going to get a choice. They're going to have you being armored up again. So I say, why not stay with body armor? All right, next question. What about knives and special forces? Now, if you graduate the special forces qualification course, you are issued a Yarbo knife. Now, if you wear this Yarbo knife on your kit, you will be made fun of in special forces. Nobody wears that knife. I never got issued one when I graduated in 1998. You didn't get a knife. That, would, that program was started later in the 2000s. As a Green Beret, I could go back and buy one, but to me, uh, it wasn't important enough to have a Yarbrough knife. I'm not really big into knives. Now, I did carry some knives on me during my deployments. I talk about it in my war belt video, but I'll go over the knives here. I got this cold steel push dagger when I was an infantryman in third of the 325 back in Italy in 1994. I'm not gonna lie, I saw the movie Platoon and I wanted to be like Barnes and have a push dagger. Uh, this knife has been with me on every deployment, three Iraq tours and three Afghanistan tours. I normally wore this knife uh, basically on my belt in the small of my back so I could reach for it mainly with my left hand. Now I'm not a big knife fighter, but my plan was if I ever got in a knife fight, I, I have some decent boxing skills. I have a pretty decent jab with my left. So my plan was if I got in a, 
a knife fight, I was going to pull out my push dagger and basically jab and have a lethal option with my jab. I've never used this in combat, but that was always my plan. Now, in Special Forces, we, do, we don't do West Side Story knife fighting where you face off with another guy knife on knife. Uh, we do have a program, program called SOCP, Special Operations Combatant Program where you mix in a lot of jujitsu and boxing and kickboxing, but the whole goal of the program is to fight back to your firearm. And knives are included in the program, but knives are included as a way to make space. They're considered a space maker. If you get tackled, if you can't get to your pistol, and chances are to defeat a gun grab, you're gonna have one gun, one hand, defending your firearm from it being grabbed and used against you, uh, leaves you only one hand free. And the idea is you get to that knife that's on your kit, you stab your opponent to make space to get to your firearm and finish the fight with the firearm. Because if you get tackled in a gunfight, you don't wanna be sitting there doing arm bars and all these fancy moves. You wanna to fight to your firearm, take care of that threat because there could be other arm threats coming and you don't wanna be sitting there on your back doing some high-end jujitsu moves uh, that could end up with you being shot. So uh, small knives are pretty popular in SF. And uh, I can tell if somebody's had SOC P training because your pistol will probably really be out of play. You'll be protecting it with one hand. Uh, people who wear knives on the same side as their pistol, I know they haven't had training because you want your knife center line or opposite of where your pistol is. So it gives you options. So if my right hand is tied up defending my pistol from a grab, I got my left hand free to grab my knife from the left side. You don't want to wear the knife same side as a pistol because now your hand will be stuck there either protecting the pistol, trying to go for a knife. You can't do two things at once. The other knife I carried, this I carried all my tours. This Glock knife I got back in 94, 95 again when I was in Italy as an airborne paratrooper. Now this is a Glock knife. It's a Glock field knife. And I carried this during all three of my Iraq tours. I didn't carry it in Afghanistan. And basically I use this as a utility knife to pry stuff, to cut stuff, to hammer on things. I've actually broke the tip off and had it reground and resharpened, just using it as a pry bar. Uh, maybe I could uh, go to it as a fighting weapon, but again, I was never really a big knife fighter and I never envisioned myself uh, fighting out with a knife. Uh, this sheath is from the Glock store. They still sell it, pretty cool Kydex sheath. But yeah, this was on me, uh, on my left side again, during all three of my Iraq tours with my pistol on the right. So these are the two knives I most carried. Now there's some other smaller pocket knives I had, but if it came to fighting with a knife, chances are it was gonna be one of these. All right, last two questions. What is the most risk to my life thing I've ever done? And what would I have done if I never entered Special Forces? Well, to answer the first one, I've been in a lot of, I would say, gunfights uh, during my time. I would say for the length of service that I've had in Special Forces, 19 years in Special Forces with six combat tours, I have probably seen the average amount of combat that other SF soldiers with the same length of service in the same time period in which I served have seen. Uh, I wouldn't say I have seen a monumental amount of fighting, but I've had my share of close calls of bullets hitting within a few feet of me. Uh, but honestly, the most dangerous thing I probably took part in or great, greatest risk to my life was that uh, reconnaissance slash intel gathering that I talk about in my history of the MP5 video. And that was during the Iraq days. I was part of a two or three man team and we would go and collect intel on the enemy, on the insurgents, and we would basically go in civilian clothes, kind of try and blend in a little bit. But during these reconnaissances, we would go in insurgent held territory and do our reconnaissance thing. Uh, if you got caught, uh, the result would be catastrophic. It would be two or three of you on the ground in an isolated area, uh, fighting, uh, fighting it out, trying to get out of that area, or hoping your ODA, which was providing overwatch, sometimes as far as an hour away from being able to get to you. So it never happened to us. We did our jobs well, uh, but on some of those missions, I would say the Parker factor was high, and had we been caught, you know, it would have led to just two or three of us uh, slinging it out with our MP5s to try and get out of there. And now there is a, uh, I know of at least one fatality 
uh, during the war in Iraq where an SF team doing the same style of mission, uh, one Green Beret was killed on that type of reconnaissance job. So there was a true uh, uh, threat of life and death doing those missions if you didn't execute the job well. And the key was to not get caught. So yes, it's not dangerous and that bullets are always flying at you and it's not the danger of a gunfight where yes, you can be killed or seriously injured, but the threat level due to the nature of the work we're doing is really high. And actually doing that job was the, probably the coolest thing I've ever done in, in Special Forces and the most responsibility I've ever had is going out as part of a two or three man team to basically collect intel on the enemy. Uh, it was super cool and it's really, uh, I view that as probably the most dangerous thing I've ever been involved in with Special Forces. Uh, again, I've probably seen the average amount of combat compared to fellow Special Forces soldiers when it comes to actual gunfights. And of course they're dangerous, but you know, that's kind of what you expect. All right, lastly, uh, had I not gone SF, what career path had I would have chosen? Well, I joined the Army as infantryman back in 1990, and at the time, prior to going into Special Forces, I was part of the 1st of the 508th. Now, before that, it was 3rd of the 325 in Italy, became 1st of the 508th, and now it's the 173rd, as everybody knows it, in Vincenzo, Italy. But I was a paratrooper back in the middle 90s, and I loved my job. I was a member of the Scout Sniper Section. I was an E6 at the time. I actually tried to extend in Italy. It was a three-year tour, and they denied my extension, and they said, hey, you're going to go to Fort Bragg and be a part of the 82nd Airborne. And in my mind, I was like, well, if I'm going to be assigned to Fort Bragg, I might as well challenge myself and try Special Force. Forces. So when I got sent to Fort Bragg, I immediately went into the uh, Special Forces selection. I made it and I went right into the Q course just because I was like, you know, I've already done time in the Airborne. I didn't feel like being part of the 82nd. So had I not gone into Special Forces, I'd probably had done my time out in the regular Army, still being a paratrooper, probably retiring out of the 82nd. Now, Let's go way back in time uh, when I joined the Army. I was also looking at joining the Air Force at the time. And had I not chosen the Army and gone into the Air Force, I probably would have tried to go to become a TACP or a CTT, your combat controller guys. I think I got that right. Yep, CTT guy uh, within Air Force Special Operations. Uh, but yes, uh, I was pretty happy being a paratrooper. But I wanted to challenge myself and ended up in a Green Bray and, of course, had a, a career that I couldn't have not been more happy with. So there it is, answering your questions. Hopefully, I've done a halfway decent job. Now, if you don't want to wait for the next six to eight months from now, when I ask for your questions on Facebook and Instagram again, by all means, throw them down in the comments. I try and respond to uh, the comments sections in all my videos. I figure if you, the viewer, take the time to watch my videos and comment down in the comments section, I'll like, at least try and acknowledge that comment or answer your questions. I don't consider myself too big or I don't consider myself a giant influencer where I'm too busy or too important. If you take the time to watch my videos, I try my best to respond. But as always, I have more content coming on the way, uh, shooting videos, gear videos, gun videos. And as always, hopefully you found this video entertaining and informative. I'm Jeff Gerwich. Thanks for watching.